let his presence marinate. Just let his presence marinate. He's holy, holy. Yes. Sing it with me, hallelujah. him this morning there's none like you in all the earth Lord God Celebrate your greatness, Lord God. There's no one like you, Lord. Lost our say, find a way at the sound of your great name. All condemned, feel no shame. Sound of your great name, of your great name. Every fear has no place at the sound of your great name. The enemy, he has to leave at the sound. Your great name, we sing it. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. The Son of God, man, you are high and lifted up. And all the world will praise your great name. God and man, you are I am lifted up. 
God and man, and you are high and lifted up. And all the world will praise. And all the world will praise your great name. Your great name, Lord. Your great name. Your wonderful, powerful name. Your great name. Your great name. Somebody lift your hands together and join me, Lord. Your great name. You are Jesus. My heart will sing that there's no other name than you, Lord. My heart will sing no other name. Jesus. Jesus, my heart will sing no other name. Jesus, come on, somebody sing. My heart will sing. My heart will sing no other name. will sing no other name As we know today, Lord, you are great among us. Your name is amazing. Your name is powerful. Your name is so exciting. We thank you today. We invite you, Father, in our families, in our marriages, in our children, in our youth, in our schools, in our malls. Everything we do, we invite you, God. Come into our lives, Lord. Lord, we lift up April month, every baby that was born in April month. We pray that, Lord, you prophetically lead them into a new destiny for their life. 
We thank you, God, for touching their lives, putting a mark in their hearts that cannot be erased. And thank you, God, for outpouring of your blessings upon every single soul that is right here, Lord, listening your word, worshiping you. We thank you for the privilege that you have given us today to gather here to celebrate your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Can somebody give the Lord a big, come on, give God a big hand clap. Give it up all the way. He is good. He is good. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming out today. Thank you so much. My name is Philip Sinder. I serve you as a pastor here. Such a great honor to serve a great congregation. And I am so loving CJC Life. How many are loving CJC Life? Let's give the Lord a hand. I'm excited. I am excited. If you, if you, you know, if you don't mind, I just want to bring a few things that as you walked in, our ushers gave you connection card and then worship guide. The worship guide talks about who we are and what we do and what is our community is all about. You know, what is your next step as well? You know, some, some people probably hear first time and you don't know what, what you're going to be doing next step and everything is in this worship guide. Please do take time during the worship service and look at it. And also we do have a connection card and we would like for you to give us information about you and your family. Number one, the reason we ask this information, number one, we want to pray for you. How many believe in prayer, right? I believe in prayer. And I would not be here without prayer. I can tell you that, sure. So we would like to pray, and I would like to pray. And the bottom of this connection card, we do have a prayer request. And if you have any comments about any ministry we have here, you know, if you don't like a coffee, let me know. So we change the coffee for you. Or if you don't like a children's, whatever comments and survey that you can give us so that we can get better what we're serving you. We're here to serve you. We're here to see what God could do in your life. We're so excited. So please take time and fill this out. And during our worship, when we worship our God with our giving, you may come forward and drop that in an offering bucket. If you're here first time with us, can I see your hand if you're here first time with us? Come on, let's give them a big hand. Up. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Awesome. Let's give them awesome. 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 We honor you so much. You know, Sundays we really focus on to connect with our guests, and I love our guests, and I want to thank you for inviting your friends and families. I just want to give you a complimentary gift before you leave this service. Make sure that you stop at our um, connection uh, board that back there, right behind our uh, uh, church, and you do have the CD available for you. Great CD. You love it. One of our uh, great uh, musicians that we have a sax player that he did a great CD for you. So please grab that CD and celebrate what God is doing. This is our compliment. Uh, love to show you that we honor you and we respect it. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap. I want to welcome you. Please watch this video. Welcome you. Vegas will be forgiven here. So today I want to talk to you about I am the light of the world. And if you have your Bibles, you can take your Bibles or you can look on screen. And the scripture that I would like to start today is John 8, chapter 12. The, the Lord himself gives us this scripture. Jesus spoke this scripture. And I want you to just kind of look at it. I underline for you for certain portion of the scripture to sort of kind of give you, you know, illumination or information or a bullet point for you to remember after you leave from this experience. It says, I am. I, I want you to pay attention to that words that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And he goes on to say, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I love to look at scriptures this perspective. Jesus did not say, I was the light of the world. He did not say, I will be the light of the world. He did not say, I shall be light of the world. If you would have said that, then there's a different things. Well, some Sometimes we go through tough moments and other times, you know, God is there. But he said something so powerful, unique, in an awesome way. He said, I 
am. I know you know the in English language very well. But if you look at I am, what that means is right now, right this moment, right this period of time, Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. And, I, I, you know, he did not say, I have the light of the world. He, that would have been better. He said, no, I am. My very presence is light to this world. And I love that. And that's where I got into this business. I started telling people I'm preaching the gospel because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the light of the world. It doesn't matter who agrees with us. It doesn't matter who doesn't agree with us. It doesn't matter what government thinks about. It doesn't matter. The heaven declares it. God declares it. The Bible declares it. And the people of God walked in the past declares it. The generation declare that God says I am the light of the world. And to me, I am so excited. The part of the light of the world. It doesn't matter what darkness around me. I walk in the light of the Lord because my God is the light of the world. I walk in light. I move in light. I breathe in light. I live in light of the world. That's what God saying. I am the light of the world. If your marriage is going wrong direction, let me tell you. He said, I am the light of your marriage. Yeah. Yeah. If, you, if you're going through the financial struggle, let me tell you, he's the light of your financial struggle. That's what God says. I am the light of the world. He is the light of the world. Look at that scripture. It's just beautiful. He is the light of the world. Turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus is the light of the world. That word world is translated in Greek cosmos. But if you look at study scriptures, the world has been translated two words. One is eon, Greek word. Another one is cosmos. But the cosmos is the entire universe. Everything you can imagine. He is the light of the world. He is the only one that is the light of the world. And he, it's, it, I want you to see that in the beginning, there was the darkness around the earth. Everywhere, darkness. And God came. He said, let there be light. So when God brought the light... He separated light from the darkness. He purposefully separated, but before light came, the darkness was there. And I want you to remember one thought as we're progressing into this sermon, that any amount of darkness cannot conquer one candle of light. Let's think that, let, let us think. The entire world of darkness to bring in a room and put one little small gentle candle the darkness will never overcome that light. A small light and huge darkness cannot overcome. One light and the entire world of darkness will never overcome. So God said, I am the light of the world. But we live in these two worlds, darkness and light. We constantly battle between those two things. And I want to identify who the darkness is. When Jesus said, I am the light of the world, let's look at who this darkness is. And it's found in Acts chapter 26, verse 17 to 18. Look at this. It said, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so they may turn from, say out loud, darkness to light. And he goes on to say, from the power of Satan to God. Now it tells us, the darkness is my friend, is the power of Satan. Satan is out there putting people in darkness. We're going to identify what the darkness is in a, in a little bit. But we all are victim to this darkness one way or another way. We all are started in darkness, and then eventually we hear the gospel of Christ, and then we open our hearts towards the Lord, and we begin to give our hearts towards Christ, and now we experience this little light, and that little light overcoming every darkness that we went through. So he's saying that the power of Satan is type of darkness that we suffer. And God said, no, I am the light, I'm going to snatch you. So when I was studying the scripture, I am the light of the world. The scripture was found right after a story, beautiful story. And I thought, 
wouldn't that be good to look at the story? Why would Jesus make this statement right after this story? He didn't make a statement in anywhere, but he made this statement, I am the light of the world, right after this story. This story is found in the book of um, uh, John chapter 8, the same chapter that we were looking. And the story is about a woman caught in adultery. A woman who were, you know, not living a life that is acceptable to the community. A woman that's been sleeping with a different man, and whether she's enjoying for the pleasure, or whether she's so selling her body, or whether she's been abused by men, we don't know. The Bible is silent. But that's the woman that found in this chapter. So I'm going to read the scripture. So we're going to identify three things in this, in this story, and I want you to connect with that. Number one is the law. Number two is the love. Number three is the light. So we're going to be identifying these three points during this story as we're going to learn something. And I pray that God will speak to you, God will minister to you so that we can apply that. So what Stu says, at the dawn, in other words, Jesus early in the morning appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down and teach them. And he goes on to say, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. So they dragged this woman from the adultery to Jesus. And they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And they said, verse 5, in the law of Moses, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say, Jesus? And the reason they said that, it's not because they love the law or nothing like that. If you look at the next verse, it says, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus. So now you can see the story, but I'll try my best to picture, put the picture before you. Jesus gets up early in the morning. Somebody say early in the morning. Successful people get early in the morning. I'm sorry that I'm getting up like 11 o'clock, you know. They get up 11 o'clock. Oh, it's too early, 11 o'clock. No, it's not. That's not 11 o'clock. It's not early. If you get up by 6, 5 is early. Successful people, they get up early in the morning. And we can follow, because Jesus was successful, we can follow Jesus' footsteps. He gets up early in the morning because it's a quiet time where he can spend time with his father. So he comes to temple. And he came to temple. As soon as he sat down, all the group of people were there. So now you can see in the picture that Jesus was sitting in the temple. And uh, all the group of people were there around him. And he began to teach them. He sat down and began to teach them. Can you imagine? He's the, he's the middle of like this. Like he's teaching them. He's saying, kingdom of God is this way. My father loves you. My father is for you. He's telling them. Bam! All of a sudden, you can hear the commotion. And they're dragging this woman out of the bed. Of adultery. And, and I want to speculate with you. Just, just join me. Just speculate with me. Can you imagine that woman's condition? Maybe she's in the middle of the act. We don't know. Maybe. And the first thing I need to identify. That Pharisees and Sadducees found her somewhere. She's committing adultery. Can you believe? There's some people always know when you're making mistakes. And their eyes were always on you because they're gazing at you. When you fall, they get celebration. You know, you fall, I'm going to drag you before Jesus. I'll tell you, no, I'm righteous. Look at this there. This guy is messed up. This girl is messed up. Now you can, t you can see the pride of that Pharisee's heart. They drag that woman out of the adultery. I don't know. I'm just speculating. Maybe she's off naked. Maybe along the way she grabbed the bullshit to cover her heart because she's so humiliated. She ex extremely, she's wounded in that moment because no women, even though they commit adultery, it doesn't matter what, no men want to be exposed publicly, especially during that time. Nowadays, people don't care, but during that time, uh, uh, adultery is a big thing, fornication is a big thing, so they dragged her off naked, threw her before Jesus, before the um, group of people. And you can imagine, a group of people like, uh, turning, looking at her. Now you have a fourth group of people here. Jesus, people that are listening the words from Jesus, and the Pharisees, Sadducees, who dragged this woman out of the bed, and their assignment to accuse Jesus, and then the woman who was caught in adultery. There are four mixed emotions going on 
in one moment. The group of people say, I'm ready to hear. What is this going on? And the Pharisees, Sadducees say, ah, we got you, Jesus. Now we see where you're going to go. Now we're going we're to ask you this question. We got you. He says, love, Moses says, to stone her. Especially it was right. The Moses law gave it to God's people. There's anybody that commits adultery, stone her. Can you imagine if we apply that today? Oh, Lord have mercy on us. <laughs> we'll be like called another Middle East here. Imagine that, like, you know. Well, you find everywhere nowadays, you know. But imagine, that was the days they're stoning the woman to die, and that was God's way of telling that it is not acceptable. And they're trying to use that to seduce Jesus. Jesus, we're going to say, because he's been nice to people, loving everybody, and he's hugging everybody, he's eating with the, you know, drunkards. And I'm going to tell, I'm going to use this and see how Jesus can react. If he loves her, and I'm going to tell you, you're not a son of God because you disobey the law. And they're trying to trap him. They don't even care that woman. Some people always use their agenda as an example to crush you down. There are always people there wait you to fall so that they can use that falling as their own benefit to escalate into new level. When you climb on people to go into the new level, you're abusing what God has made you. And that's not how we should be going. And Pharisees trying to take their position of leadership before people. No, we are the true leader. We are the people that God assigned, not Jesus. He doesn't have no clue what he's talking about. We know the law better than Jesus. And they're trying to get themselves above. Have you ever tried yourself? You know, God says he's the one that gives promotion. Promotion doesn't come from the south. It doesn't come from the east or west. It comes from the north. Why? God is the one watching your heart and see how faithful you are in little thing and he will elevate you in the right time. When you're trying to elevate your time, before your time comes, you're crushing people along the way when you're climbing up. And we notice that all the time in our life. We see it. But it says, that's not how we should be doing so I want you to know one thing here. Law reveals our errors. Nothing wrong with the law. Law reveals our error. In other words, the law reveals that I'm guilty. That's the purpose of God put the law in the Bible. It's not for the purpose of now I want to escape the law. No, the purpose of the law is to reveal to me that I am guilty. Can I tell you something? As soon as you identify you're a sinner, now you're going to cleave to a savior. As long as you feel like you're not a sinner, you never seek for the savior. And that's kind of how we live sometimes. I'm sorry to say, you're looking at a sinner here who longs for savior's touch every day. Without savior, I cannot be. And the Lord reveals to me how bad I am. Let me give you some survey. I know you guys are looking at me like, are you seriously, pastor? Let me throw some commandments here. Let's see how many of us really put their commandments in together. The commandment says, <laughs> you shall not lie. How many do you lie here? Are you seriously? <laughs> Nobody lies here? One more time. I'm going to say, how many, do, how many liars here? Oh, yeah. I'm glad you say, say it. Some of you are like, no, I'm not. No, you are liars. Not saying you're not lying. You're already lying because we all lie. Including myself, we lie. How about this? <laughs> How many steal some stuff before? And come on, put your hands up. I see your bags, the CJC pants, or you stole CJC pants, and you took them home. No, no, you steal something. Come on. We all steal. <laughs> I'm just doing the survey. Just. How about this, man? How many are committing adultery? We don't need to commit adultery. As soon as you're in the mall, you're going with your wife, you're like, oh, praise God, check out, oh, ooh, hallelujah, my God, that's, oh, what are you doing? We are, our hearts are already going after something that's not of God. We're committing adultery. So, technically, we're full of people in this room, liars, stealers, and adulterers. 
welcome to the hospital. <laughs> yes, I am the chief of all. <laughs> so you look at me, no, no, I am, I am. I was a liar. And I am, you know, we, we all go through these things. It's just, just to, because we're so busy trying to push that out. The moment when you discover, yes, Lord, I am a liar, now you're going to cleave towards a Savior because Jesus is the only one can forgive my lying sin. Nobody else on the planet can forgive. Yes, I made a mistake, but I know the Savior that he is a graceful towards me and I can live life without him. I depend on him. I confess myself a sinner. If I confess it, now God stretches out. I say, I'm going to give you a Savior. Amen. So when you recognize your sin, then you recognize need for a Savior. And otherwise, there is no need for a Savior. We all need a Savior. You know, sometimes, you know, in the, in the lying thing, we all have a lie. You know, we lie to God. We lie to, lie to spouse. We lie to family. We lie to children. We lie to, you know, wherever you go. So I thought, all this area I'm asking for, give us Lord, I'm great. But here, when Jesus said... When he bent down, he started writing on the ground with his finger. Can you imagine? As soon as the Moses, uh, Moses law came forward and Jesus bent down, he wrote on the ground. When you study that Greek word, wrote on the ground, he did not write. In the, the scholars even believe, you know, the Greek word is he wrote something against on someone. So he literally writing their sins on the ground. Can you imagine that Jesus is representing his father? First, his father wrote it on the table, tables, which is the rock. So he wrote Ten Commandments with his finger on the rock. Now he's writing that Ten Commandments, another measure, writing them on the ground as well, and simplifying that he is going according to his father. He wrote against them with his finger, and when they, when they kept on questioning him, can you believe that? They kept on questioning him. He straight up said to them that let any one of you who is without sin be the first one throw stone at her. That was a good gospel. He said, if you are thinking all these elderly people and Pharisees and Sadducees, you all hear that if anyone, anyone that don't have any sin, you are the one that you can throw that first stone at her. And if you study the scripture, it's not talking about anyone who do not, does not have a sin or even it goes beyond anyone without even wanting to sin. Let that person come forward and stop. Even that person does not want to sin, let them come in. So one day, I was thinking, Lord, I repented myself, you know, my lies. I repented, I'm sorry, and I'm, I'm good, and thank you, Lord. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, oh, I'm right now, I'm so good because the Lord forgave me. And one day, you know, I happened to go to church in an old location, and there that I have a group of people outside waiting for him, you know, like wait, waiting to do something. I don't even know. But my mind was so focused on getting to the office, get some things done because I was, I was, I have an agenda to do it. So as soon as I get off the car and I put my phone on my ear, pretending like I'm on a phone, I'll talk to you later. I'm so I'm like I'm actually I'm busy and I'm I gotta go inside because I don't want to talk to anybody you know you know you know you know I was I was just walking by there's a beautiful young uh, lady that she's like hi pastor good morning pastor I said good morning and I'm I'm all like uh, you know so holy I'm like going and guess what my wife calls <laughs> at that moment I said Lord please rapture me right now. Because I'm acting like a holy pastor, yet I'm living in a life of a lie. And I'm pretending, I know you don't, you guys don't do that, you're smart guys. And I'm like, and I, I said, thank you for catching me in the right time. You know, God will catch you right time. And that day, I thought, that is not the lie. But in fact, that was the lie. Like, I was living in all along, didn't even know it. And I put my phone down, I said, Sweetheart, I'll call you right back. <laughs> my heart is filled with the guilty. I said, please, somebody throw a stone at me. <laughs> this is the pastor of the church lying to himself, lying to people. And I caught myself. But what did I do? I told, I apologize that. I am sorry. 
uh, I have a busy work, but I'll talk to you later. I slipped out of there, went there. I was sitting in my office, I'm repenting like 30 times, please God, forgive me. I never knew, I didn't even see that I was lying myself. You know, have you ever find you lying yourself, but you didn't even know, you're like, you're pretending like, yeah, it's going well. And all of a sudden, bam, God opens the door, like, <laughs> finally I got. So I was in that place where even though I was not sinning, but I want to sin. It was not, I thought I was not sinning, but I was sinning, want to sin. I want to escape from people. I want to be hiding and pretending like I'm on a phone. Some of y'all do it in the mall. You know, you're checking everybody, but you're in the mall. Because you don't, you don't want to talk to, you don't want to talk to the people that walk in the mall. What can I do? No, I ain't got here. Let me check on that. Because you don't want to buy, but you, you're just pretending. But I noticed that I was like, I'm the only one, but a lot of people are doing it. And I thought, God, maybe I can do that, you know. But God one day caught me, said, no, it's wrong. You want thing to sin. You're wanting that from people to believe in that. So Jesus said, when they kept on questioning him, he straight up, he said, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down. And wrote, wrote on the ground, next verse. He says, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until the only Jesus was left. Can you imagine all this group of people there? Now, the older people left first. You wonder why older people? I don't know why older people left first. I believe the older people sin more. Because you've been here longer, so you probably lied more than I do. That's what I just say. I don't know. It's just my speculation. Forgive me. I just pray for my pastor, your pastor. Just, I just think, you know, and the old people think, man, I, I ain't got touch. I, I messed up. I just, I, just, I, just, I just yelled at my wife. I messed up, you know. I just dropped my stone. I get out of here. Even though these people who believe the law so much, but they could not see their own mistakes. And this is the problem with us in church people of God. Church people who condemn other people, you cannot see your own sins. Once you look in your mirror, God will speak to you. There's something in your heart that you're still sinning. You don't have the power or authority to condemn anybody before you stone anybody. you got to ask God, show me my heart. If I am pure, then I have right to show as somebody. As soon as you receive, say, Jesus, Savior, been in church 20 years, does not make you to stone anybody. I'm preaching good better than you're responding. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap. And that's exactly what these people were doing all along. Can you imagine in the group of men, maybe some men slept with that woman too. You don't know. How do you know, pastor? Because I'm a pastor. I have a microphone, I can tell what I want to tell. <laughs> it's just my speculations. Who knows? You know, she, when I call her, she, need, she didn't come. Now I'm going to stone her. <laughs> and Jesus knew everything he's writing down on their sins. You may be here. Somebody is condemning you. You may be here, living in that heart that you're questioning why. You may be here that whatever I do, I'm still being guilty. I have a good news, my friend. Jesus is your light. If you can come before him, as that woman was brought before him, when, when, when the Lord looked at her, he says that at this, those who heard began to leave. Only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus was standing there with that woman. And verse 10, he says, Jesus straightened in a up, and he was sitting there when there, everybody's accusing. And it's a good point to extract something. When people are accusing you, the best thing for you to do is rest. Don't respond to the accusing, and just stay in peace and rest. People will talk today, and tomorrow they shut up, because everybody will have a mouth, and they will talk about you, they don't like about you, they're going to say something that they don't like about you. It doesn't matter what they do, but if you can maintain your peace for a season, and tomorrow those mouths will be disappear because you're keeping your posture before God and trusting God. He doesn't, yes, God, I made a mistake. If that move, that is that woman is guilty, yes, she was guilty. Was that woman made a mistake? Yes, she was made a mistake. But that's not what Jesus is looking at right now. He's looking at, can I show mercy? And 
this is what I love about Jesus showed mercy to this woman. Yes, you made a mistake. Yes, you jacked up. Yes, you are lost. Yes, you've been making mistakes. But I gotta tell you something that the that my father that lives in me is a merciful father. He's not here to condemn you, he's not here to break your back, he's here to show you the love so that you can respond to the love better than the law. Law can condemn you, but the love can extract you from the pain you're going through. That's what Jesus is responding to. I love this woman. Mixed feelings going on. I am bad. I made a mistake. I deserve death. I feel guilty. But at the same time, she's looking at the light of the wall. She hears this thing. And he asked her a question. Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir. I love the humility in this woman's heart. Have you ever seen people that make mistakes have a good, humble heart? I've seen people in church prideful. People that are outside the church humble people. They're hungry, they're longing. This woman says, no one, sir. Because she knew she made a mistake. She's humble. She said, then Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. I want you to know, God is not condemning anybody today. I know you're going to look at me, I'm crazy. As soon as Jesus paid a price on the cross, he said, it is finished. Your sins, my sins were on him. When he died, we died with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. When he was risen from the dead, he was risen. And we were risen with him. My sins from the past and the present, future, everything was forgiven. And that doesn't mean I'm going to go ahead and sin. No, my friend, because the mercy that was revealed to my heart, because the love that revealed to my heart, so I can say goodbye to the life that I used to live. Now I can embrace the life that God is giving to me because this life has no condemnation. Amen. Condemnation. Somebody say number eight. Book of John chapter, chapter eight. And when you go home, read Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight begins like this. I like the eight is a new beginning. That's why I say John eight Romans 8, when you go home, read the Romans 8 begins like this. Now, therefore, there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Today, my friend, if you choose to be in Christ Jesus, no condemnation can pollute your life. No condemnation can keep your life. No condemnation can paralyze your life because Jesus' power is greater than any condemnation. The light of Jesus has the essence of greatness than anything that can condemn all the power. On earth, my own family cannot condemn me. My own friends cannot condemn me. It doesn't matter who speaks against me. It will not be condemned to me. Only because of him. Neither do I condemn you. <laughs> Turn your neighbor and say, no condemnation. <sighs> You probably, you probably think, then who is that telling me that I am wrong all the time? Book of Revelations, chapter 12, it says, Satan is adversary, accuser of brethren. He's the one accusing you every day. He's telling you, you made a mistake. He's telling you, are a loser. He's telling that, yeah, you, you've been nice to your husband. Look at you, what you're looking at other man. He's telling yeah, you've been nice to your wife. Look at other. So he's the one condemn you constantly. He's telling you you're making a mistake because that's what the accuser of brethren do. But once you know that accuser is speaking, now you dare enough to come before Christ and you say, Father, speak to me. Yes, I made a mistake. Yes, I was a fool. Yes, I was a stupid. Yes, I was the idiot, but now I depend on your mercy, God. Your mercy is greater than my stupidity. Your mercy is mightier than my failure. Have a mercy on me, God, as you had a mercy on the blind man. Have a mercy on me. I want to experience your authentic love. And you can hear, neither do I condemn you. No condemnation. 
<laughs> Some of you are like so excited. Wow, that's great news. So I can go now, watch porn, and God will forgive me. Yeah, that's great news. I can just sleep with that woman next day. Father, forgive me. That's not what he's trying to tell us. When you really experience the love of God, you would want to walk away from the addiction of porn. You would want to walk away from the addiction of drugs. You just want to walk away because this love is so pure and real, better than anything. Look at what Jesus told her. He gave her mercy to express the grace. Verse 11, he says, Jesus declared, go now. Somebody say, go now. And live your life of sin. And right after this, he said, I am the light of the world. So he ends the story with this statement. He says, it's urgent right now. Now you experience the law of my father. Yes, you deserve to be died. Yes, you know you condemned. But I'm showing you the mercy and love. Now I'm going to capture you. I'm going to bring you into my father's kingdom. But I got to tell you something. Now it is important to know one thing. It is urgent now. Go live your life of sin. Another translation says, go sin no more. Yes, he is merciful. But let's not take advantage of that mercy. I love that story. But the story comes to real conclusion on this one verse. It is urgent now. You that are trapped in darkness, it is urgent now. Get out of the darkness, come into light. You that are being arrested by darkness, it is urgent now. Come out of that. You don't have to stay in that lifestyle. Some of you have the behavior darkness, which is a secret life. You've been hiding inside and secretly doing things. You don't want to let your wife know, your husband know, your ex-husband know. You have an ex-husband. There's some secret life is going on. And you're probably watching the addiction porn. You're secretly watching your iPhone. And you said, nobody's watching me so I can see. And God is watching at the same. And some of us have the belief darkness, which is the shame. Shame. You don't like yourself. You are afraid of yourself. You always see yourself as so lonely. You always see yourself you are worth for nothing. You see yourself that you are so guilty. And come out of the darkness, the Lord says. Don't leave there and pack your bags and leave from there. Come into light because the light has a great power. It will destroy your behavior. It will destroy your beliefs. And the light will shine so bright. Then you can declare the glory of God in the rest of your life. It is urgent. It is urgent. I don't know how much you feel. I feel urgent. Pack your bags. Don't stay there. He said, I'm going to give you mercy. But he told this woman, go and live your life of sin. You know, I studied about this woman. She, if she really obeyed Jesus, she left that place. She followed Jesus the rest of her life. And she humbly served him. She humbly cleaved to him. When I went to Israel with my wife in recently, we saw a huge temple was built on her name. Legacy, she left it because she responded to this Christ authentically. Sometimes we say it, yes, God, I'm going to change my habits. But we don't really say it with our hearts. But now God is saying, he's going to give you the power to walk away. Look at Jesus would not say, go and now and live your sin life. Unless Jesus knew something you need more than what you've been tasting. So he, he allowed you to experience that mercy of love so that you can walk away from the love, law, and life of a lie. So two thoughts today. The law reveals our errors. And God's love reveals mercy. If you're making a note, law reveals our guilty, our error. The God's love reveals mercy. 
CJC Life, we don't just preach the grace only. I believe in grace. I love grace so much. I would not be here without the grace of God. But I do know one thing. I never understood the grace until I made a mistake. I, the, when the law came and told me, Philip, you're a liar. Then immediately my inside started crying. God, I need a mercy from you. Nobody can pay a price like you did. I need a mercy from you. So we are the people that we balance this doctrine. Law reveals the guilty. So we will sometimes tell you what you're doing is wrong. It's not because God wants to beat you down. God wants you to walk away from the sin life so that he can embrace. But if you look at the end portion of the scripture, you know, it sounds like Jesus is preaching to her. Like, you know, go, sin no more. You know, I'll tell you one more time. No, don't do that. That's not what Jesus really meant there. He didn't say, woman, get up, come here. Let me talk to you. So now I talk to all y'all. They're all gone. It's you and I. Let me tell you something. You need to stop what you're doing. And I'm tired of seeing this thing. And go home. and stop. That's not what Jesus meant. He meant this. this is what he meant. He said, now go now and leave the life of your sin. And he goes on to say, because I'm the light of the world, you can follow me as you're following me. You're going to leave behind the stuff that you've been into. You follow me, then you're going to leave behind the stuff you've been into. Look at Ephesians 2, 4 says that, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. So Jesus showed mercy to that woman. Can we imagine that I want you to know something in that story and the people of our preachers like a Pharisees, Sadducees, showed to her law of Moses and they, they encouraged people to buy into law of Moses and everybody were taking the stones to throw stone at her because they believed in the buy of, uh, law of Moses and Jesus who has absolutely right to you know, do whatever he can do because he's the son of God and he has a right to understand the law. He said, I am the law, I came to fulfill the law but yet he chose to show her mercy. It's just to show her mercy. It's a good lesson for you, husband, wife. When your wife makes a mistake, are you going to stone her? Or are you going to extend mercy to her? People make a mistake. When your girlfriend makes a mistake, are you going to show her mercy? Or are you going to stone her? Because whatever we sow, we eventually reap. What that means is, today you might be perfect. Take notes, tomorrow you will fall. Everybody in this room make mistakes. Nobody is going to be exempt from the mistake making. We all make mistakes. But we need to know, when somebody falls before me, am I extending mercy or am I extending law to condemn? And the second point that I want you to know, love reveals God's mercy. When you experience God's love, it reveals God's mercy. And at the end, he says, next verse, he says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, and now he stood up, he spoke to this woman, now he stood up, now the people were there, way back there now, and now he said to the people, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Somebody say, will never walk in darkness. But he says, but will have the light of life. And that's what Jesus is telling today. He's the light of the world. And he is right now. And he's going to ready to do for you. He's going to reveal that to you. He says, whoever, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. I love the portion, never. I am not part of the darkness. I'm part of the light. You are not part of the darkness. You're part of the light. You are born into light. God calling you into light. Nobody teaches us in school systems like we're, we grow up and thinking like, you know, this is how the life is until we begin to taste the light of the life. Now we begin to feel that God is there for me and he is going to lead me in light. I am the light. Tony and Everett say, I am the light. So today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up. If you can just bow your head. And you might be here today. You might be like that woman right now. That you may be accused by people. Or maybe you are that like a Pharisee or Sadducee. Maybe you're accusing somebody. 
Or maybe you like the people. Man, I made a mistake. I don't have a right to condemn anybody. Or maybe you live in right now in condemnation of watching porn or committing adultery or, or lying or stealing. Or maybe you did something. You didn't even pay your taxes. Maybe you did not do taxes. And then you, you live in a condemnation and you're, looking, you're, you're walking in the darkness. Maybe you know Jesus, but you're still maybe dwelling in darkness. My friend, I want to invite you today to this light. I want to invite you to this light that's going to shape your life. And this moment is between you and God. And I, I present to you this gospel. And I'm showing you God is merciful. He's going to show you mercy. He's not here to condemn you or judge you. The law is the one condemning you or judging you. The law, as long as you live in the law, you're going to stay in darkness. As long as you've been accused by accuser, you're going to stay in darkness. But once you recognize you're guilty, once you recognize you are a sinner, once you recognize you are making a mistake, once you recognize your errors, and you say, God, yes, I am a sinner. I need that light. I can't live life like this, God. I want the light of life in me. And if you do that, can I see your hand so I can pray for you? Hey, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. I declare, oh, water watcher, that's awesome. Thank you, sir. 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 Anybody else? Yes, Pastor, I, I do condemn sin. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I, I, I admire you. I pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. God is going to elevate you a whole new level. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, sir. God is going to take you. Another thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Look at those hands. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This is a moment that I want you to just look upon him and don't worry about who condemn you, whom you condemn. And I said, God, I need your mercy, God. Say so you can whisper it or you can speak out loud. And say, so Jesus, forgive my sins. I am a sinner. Come into my heart. Be my light. Lead me, Lord. I depend on you. No one else. I depend on you. I long for your mercy. I long for your love. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you can just be quiet, just be quiet for a moment. There are some people, they're still confessing. Just let it go. Let it go. Nobody's going to condemn you. I'm not here to condemn you. My father is not here to condemn you. Let it go. I'm asking you to follow him. Go now. Leave that life. He's going to give you strength. You may be here. You're like me lying. And you're trying to ask God, God, how do I get out of this? First ask him, God, I need your help. He's, he's going to lead you. I feel his goodness in this room. His mercy is revealing to his people. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Father, that I'm so glad that nobody else in this earth can speak like you are. Even though you spoke 2,000 years ago, I am the light. You still are the light. We're so grateful to you. As we're living in this generation of pollution, darkness everywhere, but you still lit that candle of light to us. Thank you, God, for saving us, God. Thank you, God, for leading us, God. Where would be we without you, my King? Help us, all of us, God. Lead us so that, Lord, we would not be like that Pharisees. Lead us, God, so that we would not be like the woman. Lead us, God, that we will be like you who showed mercy in a right time, a right way, who showed love to that prostitute woman. And your law reveals guilty. Your love reveals mercy. Your light reveals hope. I thank you for that hope that is coming on every single soul in this room. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Can somebody give the Lord a hand clap? Come on. Bless his name if you can. Bless his name if you can. So his light reveals, reveals that hope.
He's still going to give you hope. And this week, I had a moment with a couple. And the couple came that wife and husband argued on one thing. That they were struggling. And after this, we're going to worship God with our giving. But I want to show you something to you to kind of inspire you this. That me and my wife went through the same thing. Like, you know, I believe in tithing to God. It's because Bible says that. And I don't have any questions. My wife, when we first got married, no, I'm not going to give that my ties because that's too much for me. I got to pay my bills. And a long story short, I started like, Lord, you got to help us because I don't want to, I want to have a life that is meaningful to me and for you and my family. God, you need to touch my wife. And then, you know, long story short, one day my wife, we were in a church somewhere and she wrote thousand dollars check to church and I almost fell to the ground. And God brought a revival to my marriage when we had a disagreement. So I had a couple today, uh, this week, that came up to my office and they had the same disagreement. And I thought I would like to show you this video and then we're going to worship with our giving. I want you to watch this video. So I'm, I'm not here to, you know, put a condemnation on anybody. If you're here, guest, first time guest with us, this is our gift to you. But I do I want to ask you to, if you consider this is your home church and part of the church, please do because it's for your own good. You're not tithing for church. Don't ever feel like, man, preachers need our money. Now, that's not uh, all the preacher's intention, but you need to learn from the word of God. It says, when you tithe for your own blessing, you're not doing for others, but you're doing for you. And when I came here, $300 in my pocket to this country, the day I learned that, I started tithing. That was like 2003. And from 2003 to where I am, what I am doing, the church we bought, everything is God is doing. Because when you put God first in your life, and He will put you first in His life. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. So, I want to bless you. I want to ask you to obey God and do it. If you can stand to your feet as we're going to worship our God, please do fill up the connection card with a prayer request. You may drop that off right after our experience, we do have a prayer here. If anybody needs a prayer, we will be praying for you. If you can stand to your feet, you can you can worship God with our tithes giving online, our text to give. Also here, right here, check right text to CJC Life. And we're going to pray blessings over you as a pastor. Father, I believe that you said to bring the tithes and offering before your home. And Lord, as we bring these tithes and offering, we depend on you, God. We thank you for rebuking the devourers for your people. And thank you for open doors for heaven to pour out the blessings over them. We thank you for the light that's going to shine on every single person in this room. And we bless them in Jesus' name. And we give you all the praises to the Lord. And so in Jesus' name. out of here, I want you to know one more time that Jesus is not condemning you. In fact, he's showing mercy to love you. Let no one condemn you. If enemies speak to you, remind him his future. And he tells you about your life. Remind him ending of his life. Jesus loves you as you are. And he shows his love as you are. Now if you are in that pain and darkness and shame, unbelief, or if you walk in that behavior that you know it's destructive to you and your family, now is the time, my friend. Walk away. Let God elevate you into a new level of your life. Father, we thank you today. We speak a blessings over your people, God. 
We bless you, people of God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We bless you with the word of God. We bless you with the presence of Jesus Christ. We bless you with the anointing and the ability of Jesus Christ. And we bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Grace of our Lord, love of God, fellowship of Holy Spirit will rest upon you. He will go before you as a consuming fire, making every impossible possible. If you're a guest with us, don't forget to grab the CD on the way. Have a blessed day. And we will be here 12.30 for 301. Let's give the Lord a big hand clap. Have a blessed day in Jesus' name.